Hi, I'm John McClellan. Uh, we're gonna talk about chronic impulsive aggression, both diagnostic and treatment issues. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Washington and a child psychiatrist. Uh, as far as disclosures, I have uh, grants from the NIH. I do genetic research, mostly with schizophrenia. I'm also the medical director of Child Study Treatment Center, which is the state hospital for kids, uh, for kids in Washington state. And at that setting, most of the kids that we treat have some problems with chronic aggression and outbursts. The other thing that's really timely about this talk is that I've been working with ACAP and uh, Gay Carlson, who's the, just now the past president of ACAP, her presidential initiative was to develop guidelines and just recognition for the problem of serious emotional outbursts. Uh, and in one of the things that we created, I was on our task force, was an article, Narrative Review, Impairing Emotional Outbursts, What Are They and What Should We Do About Them? And that's going to be coming out in the Orange Journal and JCAP uh, soon. It's in press now, and they're working on the final edits and stuff. So hopefully you will all have that available soon. And uh, Gay was really interested in this topic because outbursts are this enormous issue in child psychiatry, and yet they're not really well captured by any of our diagnoses. Uh, and as part of that initiative, hopefully soon this will be a resource to you that we created a definition of impairing emotional outburst, uh, developmentally inappropriate displays of anger or distress manifest, manifested verbally and or behaviorally with physical aggression towards people, property or self that are grossly out of proportion in frequency, intensity and uh, or duration to the situation or provocation and lead to significant functional impairment. It's kind of a mouthful. Uh, but that has been proposed and has moved along as an, uh, a future R code for DSM-5. And if you're not familiar with R codes, R codes you can use to describe uh, as an add-on to whatever diagnosis you're making. So if you're working on an inpatient unit and you're admitting a kid with ADHD who was really admitted because they were aggressive and explosive, you can add this R code and better describe what's going on. Uh, part of the difficulty with chronic aggression and outbursts is that because it doesn't fall neatly into any one category, it's really hard to track how common or, or impactful a problem this is across different systems of care. So, and a lot of this in writing this was sort of dealing with definitions because the literature is also a mess about how these different behaviors are described. Uh, aggression is behavior that's intentionally uh, carried out with the proximate goal of causing harm to another person was motivated to avoid that harm. And there's kind of two major categories of aggression. Uh, proactive, instrumental, that's aggression where you're specifically using aggression to get something that you want. It's more thoughtful and strategic, uh, planful. Uh, that is less common, although it's a real serious problem when it does occur. Uh, what's more common is reactive. So you're in a situation and all of a sudden you lose it, you're upset over something, you want something. You, uh, you're impulsive and you react uh, badly, you have an outburst to try to solve whatever problem it is that you're facing. And children and, and adults as well, that's by far and away the most common kind of aggression uh, and outburst that occurs. And it's certainly a, a very common problem in child psychiatry practice and in kids' mental health practice. So, um, so one of the interesting things in trying to review and write this is that, again, the literature, there is just no single set literature for aggression or outbursts. That uh, the various topics that this covers includes emotion dysregulation, irritability, what has historically been, uh, or at least over the last couple of decades called pediatric mania. I'm also giving the talk on bipolar disorder, so we'll address some of this in that talk as well. And then variably temper outbursts, rages, storms, meltdowns, hissy fits. There's lots of terms that people use to describe this phenomenon. Uh, and as I mentioned, you can't simply look up one single disorder, that some of the disorders include aggression or outbursts uh, in their actual criteria with the one probably most commonly used by folks is DMDD, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. But outbursts and aggression can occur in the context of any number of disorders, disruptive behavior disorders, ADHD, mood and anxiety disorders, PTSD and trauma-related syndromes, kids with developmental disorders or autism, uh, Tourette's, and then certainly individuals that have psychotic illnesses, schizophrenia, uh, or schizoaffective disorder. Uh, 
And so again, this problem is it, it's universal in clinical settings, but it, it's hard just to simply track it from a diagnostic standpoint. So uh, going through the spectrum of, of these different kinds of uh, problem behaviors, uh, it's first important to sort of recognize tantrums, that these are what are typically considered more normative childhood behaviors, where you have these brief uh, lasting a few minutes outbursts uh, when the kid, a younger kid doesn't get when they want or when they're upset about something. Uh, in studies of tantrums, there are some predictors of which kids then go on to develop more serious problems uh, as they get older. And the risk factors aren't surprising, but it, it involves both the frequency, the kids are having three or more uh, tantrums per week, uh, the severity of the tantrum, if they're really unable to calm or uh, last a long time, and then certainly the situation or the settings that they occur. That It's normative for kids to have tantrums with their parents. Uh, it becomes a bigger problem if they start having them in unfamiliar settings or with unknown people. And then there's always this issue about the tantrum seems unprovoked unprovoked or there's no apparent triggers. They just occur out of the blue because the kid is so irritable. And in children that have these more serious kind of tantrums, early intervention, behavioral interventions are warranted uh, and hopefully in heading off the kids from developing later more severe outbursts. <clears throat> there's a number of risk factors that have been identified in kids that have chronic aggression. Uh, and these are both related to the kid, the environment, uh, as well as the interactions that the kid is having. Uh, things like anxiety, fear, poor impulse control, uh, developmental lags are all associated with an increased risk for aggression. Certainly individuals that develop psychotic illnesses are at risk. There's lots of environmental exposures and risk factors, including, and, and again, in my state hospital, most of the kids are referred because of aggression and outbursts, and most of the kids have tra trauma histories, maltreatment, child abuse, exposure to domestic violence, and just frankly, social chaos. Uh, and one of the sort of th themes that we're, I'm gonna keep harping on during this, there's a lot of interactional uh, dynamics that goes on in outbursts. And even though they're often described as having no triggers or uh, nothing that predicts them, it's usually the case that they occur in some context, some dynamic interaction, either with parent and child or, or between parent and child or between peers or with teachers, but there's some social interaction that helps set them off. And then finally, obviously, there's different disorders that by definition are associated with irritability, anger, and aggression, with DMDD being now the most common one that's diagnosed. It's also important to recognize that aggression and suicide are associated with each other, that risk of self-harm and suicidal behaviors are increased in kids that have emotion dysregulation uh, and aggression. And, um, and I, as the kids get older, this becomes a bigger, bigger problem. There's also concern about diagnostic bias, that uh, Black, Hispanic, and Asian kids are uh, just given the same set of symptoms, they're less likely to be diagnosed with ADHD and more likely to be diagnosed with a disruptive behavior disorder than white kids, uh, which often influences the, the way that people consider them or treat them. Uh, and if you look at incarcerated Black and Hispanic kids, they often have unrecognized mood, anxiety, or trauma-related disorders that contributed to whatever behavior that got them in trouble in the first place. And so it is important that whatever biases or uh, diagnostic errors are being made are recognized so that these kids can get appropriate treatment. So in going through sort of standard uh, treatment guidelines, and none of these will really be surprising, uh, but it is important to be systematic in both your diagnostic and your treatment approaches. Uh, there needs to be a thorough diagnostic assessment uh, that evidence-based treatments need to be used for whatever diagnosis the kid has. It's really important to measure treatment response and outcomes, and there are scales available to do this. And for the most part, all the recommendations uh, really start with psychosocial, behavioral, psychoeducational interventions before you start using medicines. In the real world, medicines are often the stopgap and they're often used most often just given that you've got 10 minutes to evaluate the kid, the kid's out of control, you're worried about everyone's safety, and so you reach for the prescription pad. But the treatments that actually work are really more involved in teaching the kid and the family new skills and coping strategies. So uh, in the comprehensive diagnostic assessment, um, obviously you're identifying whatever the primary targets of treatment are gonna be. 
Most treatment recommendations focus on whatever the primary disorder is. Uh, to me, the big differential right in the beginning is differentiating outbursts uh, that are driven solely by internal stimuli and, and thought problems. So people that have psychosis or someone in the middle of acute manic episode, uh, those behaviors may solely be due to whatever paranoid or disorganized or confused thinking that they're having. Uh, and those are also rare situations and most kids don't have those disorders. Uh, and for most kids, a lot of the behaviors are really maladaptive responses that they're in some sort of conflict or they want something or they're not getting something that they think they need and they blow up and trying to get uh, whatever, it is, whatever needs they have met. And that most outbursts in kids have some functional interactive component. There may be a discussion about that at the meeting. Not everyone may agree with that, but that's uh, certainly what the literature seems to suggest and, and what our task force came up with. There are, there's no perfect scale, again, given some of the definitional issue, definitional issues, but these are, and this will be in the handout that's created, there are scales that are available, and, and the article that's coming out has uh, other scales in there as well. All of these scales are publicly available, and so free, you can download them or write the authors and get copies of them, and they are useful to use in your clinical settings. Uh, sort of the mission statement of my little state hospital is do stuff that works. It is important to kind of focus on treatments that have, uh, you know, some evidence base and have, uh, you know, known positive outcomes for treating different problems. And if you look across the childhood psychiatric literature, the strategies that kind of work best across all different disorders are contingency management strategies cognitive behavioral therapies and psychoeducational interventions. These are kind of the core set of interventions that we use or should use. Um, but we've moved beyond realistically and pragmatically that you know every kid has a single disorder and there's a manual for every kid to treat that disorder. Kids are way more complicated than that. Most kids have comorbid difficulties. And so clinicians really need some sort of tool belt where they have different strategies they can mix and match and use depending on how, what the kid and the family's issues are. Uh, and to be a good evidence-based clinician, you have to be able to engage and motivate the kid and the family, uh, do good accurate diagnostic uh, work, which is uh, frankly somewhat of a lost arts uh, at, you know, in some settings. Uh, and certainly contingency management skills to be able to shape behaviors and ultimately teaching skills. Teaching skills is a huge issue. It's the main thing that we do for the kids at the state hospital. And they come in with all sorts of different diagnoses and backgrounds and presentations, but most of them need to learn better ways to cope and solve problems. And then there's this art form about how you combine medications and psychosocial therapies to get your best outcomes. So again, kids need to be taught skills. Parents need strategies to help manage children with difficult behaviors. You'll recognize for those of you that do DBT, there's a lot of DBT kind of elements and language and all this. And keep in mind, I'm in Seattle, the University of Washington, we are ground zero for DBT. Um, and some of this is driven, frankly, by the way that you think and conceptualize these things. If you treat these solely, uh, if you treat outbursts solely as a symptom of an illness, then somehow it becomes that it's not really the kid's problem or responsibility that this is just a symptom of an illness like hearing voices or a delusion. When in fact, usually outbursts represent some sort of attempt by the kid to solve a problem, get something that they want, get out of trouble that they're in. And if you think about it as maladaptive problem solving coping, um, it also then fits in with the DBT model where maladaptive skills are natural outcomes of trauma and chaos. And not that every kid that you treat has trauma and chaos, but certainly in, in clinics that treat more severely impaired kids, trauma and chaos are, are everywhere. And that self-harm, aggression, and oppositional behaviors, frankly, are remarkably effective in the short term as negotiation strategies. The problem is in the long run, they're destructive. And so the kid, so he gets momentarily relief from whatever their needs are, but in the long run, they, they, it just creates lots of problems for them and their family. So in this kind of, and again, this is sort of a DBT model, patients and families are doing the best that they can. Everyone has the potential to improve, except for, you know, like old faculty people like me. Uh, and that kids and families want to do better. They just need to learn how. 
And the goal of treatment is to maximize the strengths while developing strategies to help the kid and family become more functional, get their needs met without disrupting uh, the family functioning or hurting other people. So, so part of this is not just simply the assumption that this is true. You have to do functional behavioral analysis. You really have to sort of systematically look at the behaviors and kind of identify what the triggers are, what problems are being solved or addressed or created, uh, how people communicate around uh, these issues, what's being negotiated, and, and what happens immediately before and immediately after. How are they triggered? How are they reinforced? Uh, and so identifying and thinking about what is the function of behavior is a key part of in intervention. And it should always be at the forefront of when you're dealing with these kind of behaviors. Uh, and the evidence for the interventions that have been found helpful, and again, there needs to be a lot more research and a lot better interventions, but to date, the evidence uh, supports interventions that focus on these kind of contingency management or behavioral therapy strategies. So for younger kids, uh, really one of the strongest uh, evidence base we've got for all of our psychosocial treatments, it's parent-based interventions for oppositional and acting out behaviors. Things like PCIT and Triple P and Incredible Years. Um, <clears throat> there's a strong evidence base that, things say that these interventions help improve parenting effectiveness uh, with the goal is really to target uh, inconsistent or ineffective discipline strategies and kind of the negative emotional expressiveness that naturally occurs when you have a kid who's acting up all the time and to enhance uh, positive parent-child interactions. Uh, and across the board, these have a pretty strong evidence base. Unfortunately, the effects are not as great as we would like, but they're better than many of the other effects for our psychosocial interventions. Other therapies that have been promoted uh, and used, multi-systemic therapy is something that's not something you can simply just do in your office. This is an intensive home community-based service where the kids get intensive kind of uh, wraparound services or targeted in-home and community supports. Uh, and the goal is really to address all the environments important to the kid and, and to help them just be more functional both at home, at school, and with their peers. Um, this intervention was really set up to target kids with more serious, teenagers with more serious emotional and behavioral difficulties and really targeting kids that were in the juvenile justice system. And it does require a big investment at the community level. Um, if you look at reviews of MST, uh, I mean, in the most positive situations, it's reduced rates of incarceration and hospitalization, which is an enormously good outcome and also saves states a lot of money when it works. Uh, and reducing rates of conduct problems and substance abuse. The problem is the effects have been somewhat variable. There's concerns about how well it's, the, it's you know, the fidelity is done at different sites. Uh, and so overall the effect sizes are small and not all the meta-analytic reviews have been positive. Um, but it does seem that when it's done well with the right kind of leadership and intervention strategies, uh, these models certainly can be effective. I mentioned DBT, and again, DBT is a, a model that's really focused on recognizing that the behaviors that people do are often designed to address some sort of need that the person has, and the goal is to replace maladaptive behaviors with more effective coping strategies. And there's all these skills that many programs now work with, and at least with their adolescents, and teaching interpersonal effectiveness and emotion regulation, uh, distress tolerance, how to better solve problems and mindfulness. That each week in our little state hospital, we have a different DBT uh, skill that we work on that both the kids are working on and the staff are also helping the kids work on it and hopefully working on it themselves as well too. <clears throat> uh, and for folks that have done DBT, it was originally developed for adult women with borderline personality disorder. And the main outcome goals for that were reducing incidents of self-harm. Uh, as it's been adapted for youth, it's focused both on self-harming behaviors and also aggressive and oppositional behaviors. And there's now adaptations for both adolescents and DMDD that have been published. Uh, and it is uh, an intervention that's fairly widely used in different sort of milieu management things, so in hospital settings, state hospital settings, juvenile justice settings. Um, there's a lot of DBT out there. <clears throat> 
it's also important, of course, to think about medication guidelines uh, that in the main focus for using medications is to identify what the underlying disorders are that are helping contribute to the outbursts and aggression and uh, optimize the treatment for those disorders. At this point, the best evidence is optimizing stimulant treatment for ADHD. Otherwise, just in general for treating aggression, and not that this is gonna be your first choice, but the best overall evidence is really for risperidone uh, with some limited evidence for mood stabilizers and specifically lithium and valproate. So the optimizing ADHD treatment, um, this was actually originally, where it was designed as a study to look at add-on adjunctive therapies. So for kids that had ADHD plus aggression, uh, they wanted to examine uh, whether adding risperidone versus valproate versus placebo worked best for treating the aggressive behaviors. But in doing the study, they found that a bunch of the kids simply got better by giving them optimized, you know, so they made sure they were using effective doses of stimulants, and they also gave the families and kids parent training. And that worked for a number of the subjects. For the ones that it did not work, both risperidone and valproate were superior, uh, superior to placebo. So, so even though it provides information about risperidone and valproate, the main take home message of the study was optimize your stimulant dose and give the family good parent training uh, strategies. In regards to optimizing ADHD treatments, even though they're used quite a bit for this, the evidence is actually fairly limited that supports the use of non-stimulant medications, the alpha-2 agonist and atomoxetine. Uh, and so there's some studies supporting their use uh, for treating aggression, but the findings are not nearly as robust as it is for stimulants. In regards to antipsychotics, the best overall evidence basis for disorders where antipsychotics are clearly indicated. So schizophrenia, uh, real classic manic depressive illness, and then uh, treating irritability with autism spectrum disorders. Uh, if you look at meta-analyses for antipsychotics and aggression, irritability in kids across disorders, uh, the best evidence currently is for risperidone and aripiprazole. Mostly that's driven by the autism literature and the irritability, you know, irritability and autism literature. And for the other antipsychotic agents, there's just really not much evidence in kids. Probably they just haven't been studied very much for this indication. So the TOSCA study, uh, this was a study to examine augmenting uh, basic treatment for ADHD and aggression with risperidone. It's kind of similar to the later study. Uh, in this one, uh, so the kids again got standard uh, treatment, which they considered standard basic treatment, stimulants plus parent training. That was augmented with risperidone in one group and placebo in the other groups. Uh, other group, both groups showed improvement. Uh, the augmented group had better improvement and ODD and aggression, but the ADHD symptoms or conduct symptoms uh, were not really any better after six weeks on risperidone. And often what's sort of lost in this study, they did 12 month follow-up and there's really no group differences after 12 months. So take home message there is risperidone can certainly help in the short term and may help some kids longer, but it's not like you're necessarily treating or, or curing the aggression over time. Uh, and if anything, it does focus back again on what is standard of care for ADHD. And even though we talk about basic standard of care being optimizing stimulants and combining that with parent training, that's not what most kids get in the community, uh, that especially the parent training part. It's hard to find people that are good at doing those kind of psychosocial interventions. And so most families don't have access to that service. As I mentioned, uh, irritability and autism spectrum has been fairly well studied. Uh, there's eight randomized controlled trials, uh, and this was of a meta-analysis with the trials basically or uh, consisting of studying risperidone, aripiprazole, or lorazidone, and they looked at reductions in these ABCI scores, which includes irritability and temper outbursts, negative mood and self-harm. Uh, in risperidone and aripiprazole, there's evidence that both of those were effective. Turns out, at least in this meta-analysis, the, the effect for lorazidone was uh, not so great and was not uh, really better than placebo. 
There's other smaller trials or open label trials of other antipsychotics, but none of them were that systematic. There's not randomized control trials, so they weren't included in the meta-analysis. And at this point, the best evidence, again, is for risperidone and erythroprazole. <clears throat> as far as mood stabilizers, uh, there's some, uh, and most of this is actually older literature, but there's sort of a mixture of randomized controlled trials, some of which showed uh, that lithium is helpful for aggression and symptoms of conduct disorder. And, and you know, three which showed that it was helpful and two that showed it was not. Uh, and, and at this point, there's no doubt lithium is helpful for treating classic manic depressive illness and that remains, you know, and if a person has outbursts connected with that, it's absolutely an indicated treatment. But uh, the evidence is less strong for kids who are just simply acting up or dysregulated. Uh, and similarly, I think for the valproate literature, there's uh, six, and some of these are small, uh, randomized controlled trials showing some improvement for irritability, aggression, and impulsivity in various diagnostic uh, groups, conduct disorder, ODD, ADHD, uh, kids who were called bipolar or autism spectrum. Um, and it's interesting because there's these positive uh, RCTs that focus specifically on irritability and aggression, but if you look at, and we'll talk about this in the next talk, if you look at the large, uh, sort of industry-sponsored trials of valproate and oxcarbazepine uh, for pediatric bipolar disorder, uh, they're negative. They didn't really work any better than placebo. And pediatric bipolar disorder, in reality, is sort of a proxy for aggressive outbursts. That, however that diagnosis came to be defined, it includes a lot of kids that have explosive anger outbursts and aggression. You see a lot of kids put on antidepressants with the assumption that their irritability and their aggressive outbursts are related to feeling sad or feeling anxious, but the results have not been uh, very well documented that, those, that antidepressants are helpful for this. And that one meta-analysis found that the risk of aggression actually doubled on youth taking active antidepressants versus placebo. Uh, so there's some similar concern about uh, the antidepressants in a small number of kids increases suicide, suicidality, it may also, because of its activating effects, also increase aggression in some children. Uh, other agents, uh, there's uh, one randomized controlled trial that found omega-3 supplementation, reduced externalizing behaviors in kids. And this study gets talked a lot about sort of in, uh, uh, in the naturopathic literature. I, I will say, if you look at the data, in the it's a community sample. So these were not kids that were clinically referred and none of the groups had CB, CBCL uh, Achenbach scores in the clinical range. So whatever benefits it helped for the kids, these were not kids that were gonna be referred to your clinic anyway, or at least probably not referred to your clinic. I think it's important to recognize that medicines for aggression, they clearly play some role for kids who are out of control or gonna seriously hurt somebody. Uh, but they're best probably thought of as a temporizing measure that you're using to stabilize the behaviors and get the situation under control while you're trying to implement appropriate cognitive behavioral psychoeducational strategies. Um, unfortunately, it becomes sort of a crisis-based system where the kid's chronically in crisis, people keep adding or changing uh, the medicines and no one is able to sort of get a good ha <coughs> handle on, <coughs> excuse me, the other interventions. And um, so the kid stays on these medicines for a long time with combinations that keep changing or additional medicines keep getting added without effective, you know, other <coughs> interventions ever being added on or, or effectively completed. Uh, and in that regard, poly polypharmacy becomes quite common in kids with more serious aggression, but there's generally no good evidence base to support that. Uh, It's also important to note, um, this is my own particular bugaboo about inpatient units, that uh, it's pretty common, at least in the state of Washington, kids on inpatient units get a lot of PRN medications to treat aggression. Uh, and at least when you look at the data that's out there, Gay Carlson just published a study, there's no evidence that PRNs are actually helpful for outbursts. They're often a behavioral intervention that whatever effect you get happens fairly immediately, and especially if you give a shot because it hurts. Uh, 
And that's not a psychopharmacologic effect, that's a behavioral uh, effect. And it's also, uh, from my standpoint, it's, uh, it's not very realistic as an intervention strategy because you should not be using PRNs when the kids leave. And it also gives an odd message. If you think about um, aggressive behavior as a problem solving strategy, you're basically telling the kid that the way to solve their upsetness or their uh, anxiety or their sadness is to take a medicine or a drug to feel better. And these are all kids at risk for substance abuse. It's probably not the message that we're trying to reinforce. So in summary, uh, for chronic aggression, uh, kids need, and families need a thorough diagnostic assessment and identify an under, uh, underlying disorders that may be primarily responsible for the outbursts that in, uh, as you're finding and are diagnosing conditions using evidence-based treatments uh, to target those conditions. It's really important to think about the functional components of aggression and outbursts. What are the triggers? What are the reinforcers? What's driving the behavior? What skills does the kid and the family need to learn uh, to replace those behaviors and still get their needs met? and that most of those interventions are based on cognitive behavioral contingency-based strategies. Uh, and ultimately, the goal for most people that have outbursts is to teach them new skills. And in this model, this is not really an acute care model, that most kids that have chronic aggression, you're not going to fix them with a single intervention or a single course of treatment. It's more of a rehabilitative model, uh, just like learning skills that are hard is difficult. It takes time, it takes practice, and you have to keep doing them over and over again and getting better with them over time. 